All right, welcome everyone to this week's webinar. I'm Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And this week, our topic is Canvas, the Canvas control for both desktop and web. And before we get started, minor housekeeping things. Uh, actually, I don't really have much on the housekeeping list today. I just want to point out to everyone that feel free to ask questions as I'm talking. They show up on my other screen, and I can address them when appropriate. So without further ado, let's uh, talk a little bit about the Canvas. Uh, th there are two Canvases. We're going to look at both today. There's the Canvas control that you can use in desktop applications, and there's its companion, the Web Canvas control, that you can obviously use in web applications. So we're going to start by talking about the Canvas control. And let's see here. Let's switch over to the right documentation page. So if you haven't already seen this before, the Canvas class in Zojo is a, a pretty good sized class. It's got a fair amount of events and properties and methods. And when you're working with the Canvas, uh, the most important method by far is the paint event handler right here, the most important event handler, because this is where you do all your drawing. Uh, the Canvas is essentially, like its name implies, a blank slate, a blank canvas. And you can do anything you want in it as far as drawing goes. So it's a great control for creating your own custom controls for displaying graphics. It even can serve as a container to hold other controls. And the paint event is primarily where the magic happens when you're drawing your own stuff. There are, of course, lots of other companion methods that can be used in events and properties that will help you do what you need to do. So without further ado, let's jump into a little example that demonstrate some of this. We'll start with a desktop application here. And we'll make a little bar chart. Now, because that's what I do, I'm going to open up my sample one so I can move some code around. Let me get that on my other screen over here. All right, so Canvas you see over here on the library in the uh, decor section. And when you drag it onto a window, it's just a blank box. It doesn't have any visual elements of its own that you can see. You either have to draw everything yourself, or uh, if you're just using it as a container, you can just drop other controls into it. So you can just put it on, on your window and, you know, resize it how you want. That sort of thing. And that's how you would uh, get your canvas on there. And then generally there's the paint event, which is selected by default down here, that you would add uh, to start implementing your drawings. And the paint event handler provides you with two parameters. Uh, primarily the one you use is the graphics object parameter, which is simply the G uh, argument. And then you also can get an array of recs that will give you specific areas of the screen that would need to be redrawed, which can be handy for more complicated UIs where you don't want to redraw the entire thing every time. All right, let's go back here. Now for this particular thing, I'm going to make a Canvas subclass. So let, we can take this off here and I'm going to create a new class. And I will call it bar chart canvas and I'll set it super to canvas. So now I have a Canvas sub subclass, and I can select the right thing on it. I'll be able to add an event handler to it. And again, paint is the one that we are most concerned with at the moment. Now, uh, for this example, to make just a, a simple bar chart, we're just going to uh, get some values in, and then we're going to uh, use those values to draw bars. Pretty straightforward. So the first thing we want to do here, I'm going to move in some code. So this is some code here in the paint event handler. And a lot of this is just set up, but there's a constant here that's going to be the width of our bars for the chart. Um, we're calculating um, the scaling for what size uh, to draw the bars so that uh, they can take up most of the space of the canvas. 
And then we're going to have in some values that will be passed in uh, using a different property, which I'll add in a moment. And it'll just be an array of uh, values. And we're just going to loop through the array. And we're going to draw just a simple uh, filled rectangle in the color blue, one after another on the grid. So you can see how this might start to work. So let me move over. Actually, I can just type in some of the properties here. So we'll add some properties. And let me just copy over this little graph method. That doesn't really do anything except tell the, the canvas to uh, draw itself. And when you do tell canvases to draw themselves, which is something you want to do fairly often uh, whenever you give them new information to display, you're generally going to want to call the invalidate method. This tells uh, your application to essentially tell the operating system, hey, my canvas needs to be redrawn. Please do it the next time you get around to redrawing that sort of stuff. Uh, you can also call a method called refresh, which is more of an immediate thing that says, hey, redraw my canvas now. It's generally better to use invalidate because it uh, will result in less flicker. It's less overhead on the operating system and on your application. And usually there's not a significant difference. But sometimes refresh may matter if you have specific timing or other issues where it needs to be done now. The parameter of false is telling uh, Zojo not to erase the background of the canvas before it redraws anything, which also is a good technique to help reduce any flickering because you don't want to have kind of a white flash in the back uh, before your actual graphics gets drawn on the screen. Uh, very little of this is a problem when you're running on OS X as I am now because the operating system itself is fully double buffered and will draw everything off screen before it actually draws it on the screen for you. So there's no chance of flickering. Windows is not double buffered. So you do have to pay more attention to these sort of things when you're developing on Windows. Linux is generally double buffered depending on the distribution you're using. So it's often less of a problem on Linux as well. So this is our simple uh, subclass of a canvas that will just draw a bar chart. And you can see there's not a lot of code here, but we will just uh, drag this over to our window. So I just drag the subclass over to the window. So now it's available on here. And I can just add a couple prompts here to type some values in. And we can. So we'll let uh, the user just type in a bunch of values here separated by commas, keep it simple, and then press the graph button and it will display the bar chart for those things in our Canvas subclass. So that means we need to add action event handler. And this code is simply just going to take what the user typed split it out, put it into an array, and then assign uh, our properties, the values. So our canvas subclass gets what the array values are. We set the, uh, the minimum and maximum for our graph. And then we call the graph method, which just tells the canvas to draw itself. So if my cutting and pasting didn't make any mistakes, and I always forget to do this thing, I got to rename the canvas. So we'll just call this bar chart to match my code. And of course, I need to make sure that my properties are public. I forget to do this here. I'm going to go make this change here now. That little change, just to go slightly off tangent, if you set private, you get a smaller dot that shows up here. This is much easier for me to see. Those actually bars that were there before are very difficult for me to pick out. So I tend to forget that the uh, 
scope is different. So now we have a simple uh, bar graph. And this is the sort of thing that you can start to extend uh, to do whatever you want. You know, we could have drawn uh, lines for the axes. We could have uh, made a grid for, you know, every 10 rows or however we want to do it, that sort of thing. You can draw text in here by calling uh, the, uh, the draw text methods. But that's a, an example of a simple graph and how you can start uh, your own subclasses that you can be using in your applications. Uh, we'll keep this open for the time being because we're going to look at a few more desktop examples. Uh, but one thing we will do uh, when we switch over to the website is we're going to take this example and move it over to a web project almost exactly as is, and you'll see it works um, pretty much the same way. All right, let's look at another example project here that's going to demonstrate uh, the scrolling capabilities of the canvas. Let me just go to my example project folder. All right, so one thing that often is useful with canvases is putting stuff in there and being able to scroll it around. So here I have a picture of something from the Hubble's telescope, a, a nebula or something, and you can see that I can move it around with the scroll bars. I can move it around by clicking on it and dragging. And I can move it around using the arrow keys. So three ways to scroll it. And how do you do that? Well, there's a scroll method on the canvas that is the secret behind this. So all this canvas is is just a simple canvas. It's not even a subclass. I've just added to this particular window. And I've added a couple scroll bars here, uh, a vertical one and a horizontal one. There's just a, a picture that's been added to the project, the Hubble uh, picture. And if we look at our canvas, which is called scrolling canvas, the paint event handler isn't doing much more than drawing the picture. Uh, it's actually drawing a property, uh, which we have here that is a, a picture itself because the, uh, the open event handler of the window is assigning that property to the, the Hubble picture. So you can easily uh, change the picture. This would probably make a great subclass. And uh, before I put, include this example with uh, the Zojo examples, I'll probably uh, repurpose it as a subclass so that it might be easier to reuse in your own applications. So you can see the, uh, the paint event handle is just uh, drawing uh, the picture itself. But if you start with the scroll bars, you can see in their value changed event, there's just a little bit of math. And that's really that's all that's being done here is uh, we're, we're saving uh, prior positions of scroll bars, calculating the difference as in how far the scroll bar has moved. And then we're, we're sending that information off to the scroll method. And then we resave whatever the value is. And that allows, this particular one is the vertical scroll bar. So this allows the, uh, as the scroll bars move, it essentially is scrolling the picture that's in the canvas, however much that uh, the scroll bar itself has moved. And yet the same sort of code is in the, uh, the horizontal one, except it's checking uh, the widths instead of the heights, but it's still doing the same sort of thing, retaining uh, various positions, doing some math to calculate the difference, and using that to do the scrolling. So that gives you uh, the scroll bars. And then essentially, after you've done that, you can hook up these other things to the scroll bars. So the key down event handler, for example, has code in here that's checking, uh, got some constants for the various key, uh, values for the arrow keys. And then it just checks which key was pressed and it assigns the scroll bar. It essentially adjusts the scroll bar for the appropriate key by a particular unit. So I have it set up here. So when you use the keyboard, it scrolls eight uh, pixels at a time. The, and that's all this does, but it's taking advantage of the code that we already put in the scroll bar, which is pretty nice because that keeps everything in sync. Uh, the last uh, two things that are in here that are important are the two mouse down 
uh, event handlers. And these again are just tracking the position of the mouse when it was clicked. And then the drag is again doing some math to calculate how far uh, essentially the mouse has been moved. And then this is calling the scroll method on the canvas to move the picture however much you've been moving your mouse around. Now you may have noticed when we when I ran this here and I'm moving the picture, uh, it's letting me scroll it around and whatnot, which is nice, but it's not moving the scroll bars, which is less nice. So, but we can hook that up. So I can do that just by not calling the scroll method in here because I've already hooked up the scroll bars to do that. And I essentially do just the same sort of thing. I just adjust the horizontal scroll bar, however much the mouse has moved it and the same for the vertical one. And then when I run it like this, as I move the picture around, you can see the scroll bars adjust accordingly to wherever we happen to be in the picture. That's kind of neat. It's a little funky with watching those things move, but I kind of like it. But you can see everything is all hooked up together here and taking advantage of scrolling. So that, that's, that can be a pretty handy uh, technique to do. And the other neat thing you can do with this is you don't actually have to be drawing a picture in there. I mentioned earlier that you can actually drop other, uh, you can use a, a canvas as a container for uh, other controls. And the reason you would do that is to take advantage of this scrolling capability. So there could be a bunch of controls that are sitting in that canvas. And then you could use these scroll techniques to allow the user to scroll around through a user interface. All right, that is Canvas scrolling. Let's take a look at another thing that people often like to do that is really easy is zooming an image. Again, the same picture. I guess I like it. It's kind of pretty. And here you can see I just have a little slider that is scaling the picture depending on the position of the slider. Very tiny back to its original size. And this is all done just using a single line of code, relatively. Got more than one line, but the main line of code is the draw picture uh, command here, where you give it the new size that you wanna draw it at. So you can see over here that I've calculated uh, what the scaled size should be of the picture by essentially just multiplying the height and width by the position of the slider. So if the slider's at its maximum value, that's gonna use the original size of the picture. And anything smaller, it'll essentially be reducing the picture. And once we've calculated the scaled uh, size, the height and the width, we can just call the draw picture command, tell it which picture we're drawing, tell it the new size to draw it at, and then tell it the portion of picture that we want to draw. Or this is essentially our source. And the source is obviously going to be the entire picture itself. We could grab a sub portion of the picture if we wanted, but in our case, we wanna take the entire picture and we wanna redraw it at the new size. And that's all this simple line of code is doing here. But it does have a lot of parameters and can get a little confusing. You can see down here at the bottom, the uh, if I can get the little cursor to, well, I'll leave it like that. But you can see down at the bottom that there are quite a few parameters on here that just looking at the list, it's not always 100% obvious which ones you need. But this is how they work and it allows you to very quickly and easily scale a picture. Now you'll notice I'm only really scaling the picture down in this case and not up. And the reason for that is that generally speaking, scaling pictures up in size doesn't always work great. They can get pixelated very quickly. So it's often better to just go down, start, uh, take, have a picture be bigger than you really need and allow it to be scaled down. But that's all you need to do for, uh, for scaling pictures. So it's really, really easy uh, once you get the handle for the parameters you need to pass into the draw picture method. All right, well, one other thing you can do with uh, Canvas is one of the many things, so there's Canvas does so many things, I won't be able to cover everything in a single webinar, but it 
does a lot. And one other common use of it is creating custom controls. So this here is a simple button that is made using a canvas. And it's a little flip button like you'd see on the iPhone. I can click on it and you can see the little toggle switches from on to off. And it's just a canvas and it's just drawing these graphics for you. This is actually a canvas subclass. Subclasses are great because once you implement something like this, you can reuse it throughout your app or all kinds of apps. So this particular thing is a Canvas subclass. I just happen to call it switch button. I've only implemented a few event handlers. Obviously, uh, the paint event handler, that's uh, pretty much implemented on every Canvas. And then I have the mouse down event handlers implemented to capture clicks on them to toggle the button on or off. And I got a couple properties to track uh, what was clicked and the current state of the button. So if you look at the paint event handler, this is just calling uh, various methods on the graphics object that's passed in to set some colors, draw the uh, appropriate rectangle uh, rounded with the corners. Um, it's pretty much it, nothing real fancy here. There's uh, the background of the switch and then the switch itself, whether the switch is on or whether the switch is off. And you know, you can design this however you want, color it however you want. Uh, put in more properties so the user could specify colors for when it's on, when it's off, that sort of thing. Uh, the usual usual coding stuff. The mouse down event handler is just indicating that uh, the item was clicked. And the mouse up event handler is making sure we're still in the button and then toggling it. And then telling the canvas to redraw itself. And the other neat thing we do, because this is a subclass, is we're raising our own event handler. I've added an event definition to the sum class called action to match uh, the action event handle you see on a regular button. Because when you go over to the window where the, where the subclass now is here, the switch button is now on this window, you can see I, I've been able to implement the action event handler. So this means when the button is clicked, this action event handler is called because that's how I've implemented the uh, the subclass. So it provides for a little cleaner interface for you to use in your application, in other applications, or if you hand this control off uh, for other people to use, it's a little bit cleaner uh, API for them to work with. And then I have code in the action event handler that is displaying that on off that you see in the label beside it. So this is obviously a very simple control, but you can create very, very powerful and comp complicated controls uh, with Zojo. In fact, if you look at Zojo itself, I can point out parts of its UI that is a canvas. So we'll start over here on the left. The navigator is a canvas, all of it. Code editor is a canvas, all of it. This thing is not a canvas. I believe it's a container control. Uh, this toolbar, I don't specifically know, but I'm betting it's a canvas. So as you can see, we make heavy use of canvas in uh, the Zojo IDE itself. And it can do a wide variety of things. All right, I am checking my list here in the time to see what are the projects we can take a look at. All right. All right, a couple other projects here I have. Actually, I have more than a couple, but uh, we'll take a look at this one here. This is an example of a project that displays a bunch of things on in the canvas. Looks like individual objects, all kind of neat. But I can click on one and I can move it around, or any of them for that matter. I can just, you know, reposition them doing so each of the things in here are acting like distinct objects that you can actually interact with independently, even though this is really just one giant big canvas. And if we look at the window, um, well, you can't even see it. It's so big. Find the uh, small size, but you can see it's a window with just a single canvas on it. Again, a canvas subclass called drag canvas. 
And this particular technique where you uh, have a canvas that has multiple things on it that you can I interact with independently is often done uh, in this particular manner. Let's see, there's a, you can see there's a class right down here that doesn't really do anything. It has no visual um, component to it. It's just a class, but it has a bunch of properties on it. And this, uh, one of the properties is the particular picture that's going to be displayed, and then it's coordinates. And then you essentially create a bunch of these objects, if you will, and then you draw them on the canvas. So as you can see, it's just going through an array of those objects, and it's drawing each of them on the canvas at whatever their coordinates are set to be. And then there's additional code in here to indicate uh, which one has been clicked on so that it can be marked as uh, the one that's being moved. And then as it's being moved, it can have its coordinates updated. But none of the actual drawing is happening in these event handlers. It's just updating the, uh, the object. And then when it's time to draw, the paint event handler is where that happens. And it just redraws everything at whatever the new coordinates happen to be. So that's how you get this technique. You're not directly manipulating the what's on the canvas in your other event handlers. You're setting up the positioning and the object properties and whatnot so that when it comes time for the paint event handler to actually draw the current state of your graphics, it has all the information it needs and can draw everything where it needs to be. Uh, and I have another example of this that has a little bit more types of things to play with. Let's open that one up. So taking that particular concept, you can extend it out quite a bit. And you can see, hey, look, it's my favorite picture again. You can see this sort of thing. Let's me add. As I click on them, they are identified as selected by getting a border. I can move them around independently. I can have uh, methods that I call to do certain things. So I can, I have this one here that's selected. I can call this method. It'll center it here in the canvas. I can call the remove to get rid of it. And then it selects the next one in the list. I could actually sell, tell it to select a specific one. Uh, I don't remember what the number would be. There we go. And it'll select it. And of course, you can add any number of items you want. And they all, like I said, they're all uh, act as if they're independent objects. So it's a, it starts to get pretty powerful with what you can do with a canvas. And you can see how this particular project is set up. It's got a bunch of graphics, of course. But there's a, a main canvas that is responsible for uh, the drawing of the objects, but you can see it all boils down to the same technique where there's just a simple for loop in here that's drawing each of our objects on the canvas at the coordinates. And everything else is handled through various uh, event handlers to figure out what the coordinates would be, what happens to be uh, selected, uh, moving stuff around, redrawing, all that sort of stuff. So this one, this project is included with Zojo, so I'll let you dig into it a little bit more because it is uh, fairly detailed. Uh, but it is a great example for how you can start to use a canvas to, uh, to do more sophisticated things. And if you do use Windows, you do want to play with some of these, uh, particularly this one on Windows. You'll notice there's absolutely zero flickering with this particular project. Uh, because every, you're, when you're doing all your drawing in a canvas, you have complete control over what the operating system is drawing. So you can entirely eliminate Flickr. You can ensure that you're, you're drawing your stuff appropriately. You can make sure you turn off the appropriate uh, background refreshes, call and validate. And you, you just will have no Flickr in your canvas. It will draw, look rock solid, and be perfect. All right, let's go back to my folder of magical canvas projects.
And uh, before I do that, let me just check my question list here. I think I answered that one. Uh, Tony is asking if there's a suggested time to use a canvas versus a container control. And yeah, uh, I mean, generally speaking, if you want to uh, collect up a bunch of UI controls into a single place, most of the time you're going to want to use a container control. Uh, that, that does make the most sense. And if you're drawing any sort of graphics to the screen whatsoever, that's where Canvas is, is the control you're going to want to use. The, the few times where you may want to use a Canvas to contain other controls is when you need to do the scrolling. Uh, and just, I don't actually have that in my folder, but uh, it is here. With Zojo, there's an example project. that I'm not seeing come up. So, well, there we go. Guess it didn't like my examples. Let me find that folder and open up the example I'm looking for. So in the desktop folder, in the container controls folder, there is a project called oh now it won't start hang on i had trouble with my user account a little while ago the same sort of thing so i need to just copy this All right, well, that is copying in the example projects folder in the desktop folder in the container controls folder, there is a download project. Download, uh, what is it called? Download container. So let's see if we can restart Zojo here. Yeah, I put it on the desktop. All right, that looks better. So right in here, this particular one, getting back on track, is an example of, this actually uses both containers and a canvas, but you can see here how it's using a canvas. This is adding a bunch of container controls that are scrollable. So I can scroll through the container controls. Each of these container controls is actually added to essentially an invisible canvas. And the only reason for that is to use the scroll method on the canvas so that we can implement uh, the technique I showed you earlier. I did cover this example a little bit in the uh, desktop container control webinar, and it is obviously included with Sojo, so you can take a look at that. But that's primarily the only situation where you're gonna really wanna be using a canvas for uh, containing controls. And let me see here, James is asking if all the examples I'm showing today are available for download. Uh, many are included with Zojo, but not all of them, uh, but I will have them all packaged it up and uh, available as part of the uh, download here on the wiki where all the uh, archives of the webinars are. So when you go to the videos page on the wiki, uh, a lot of the uh, Webinars do have example projects and they're just linked right alongside, so you'll be able to grab them. And I'll have all these zipped up and included with uh, this webinar for you to go through. All right, so that was a little slightly off on that. So let's take a look at a couple other examples. Back to my folder here. This neat little one is included with Zojo. This just draws a little uh, analog clock on the screen and moves the second hand along with uh, the current time. That's kind of neat. Again, it's just drawing. And there's a bunch of math using pi to calculate, uh, you know, coordinates for the lines and the circle and whatnot. But that's just math. 
the actual commands to draw things are the usual stuff you would see, drawing uh, strings for the values on the clock, drawing uh, lines, drawing the actual circle for the clock. Uh, and nothing else is terribly sophisticated in the actual painting of this, but this does make use of a timer whose only purpose in life is to tell the canvas to re refresh itself, uh, I imagine, probably about once a second. Yes, about once a second. Now, this isn't going to be the most accurate clock in the world because timers are not 100% precise, but it does show you the general technique. And this particular technique is a common animation technique where if your canvas does need to display uh, information that changes or needs to be animated, you would generally use a timer of some sort to tell the canvas to refresh itself at periodic intervals. Uh, this is an example of a grid that you can uh, make with a canvas. You can see as I'm moving the mouse around with the mouse button held down, it's highlighting the uh, little box that the cursor happens to go under and would unhighlight it if I go over those as well. And it's dynamic, so you can change the size of the boxes. So lots of uh, examples there. The, these last two are included with Zojo, uh, certainly if you want to find them uh, before I get to include the rest of them. The primary place to go is to the graphics and multimedia folder here. And there's all kinds of Canvas examples in here that uh, I think pretty much everything in here is going to probably use a Canvas at some point or another. Scanning the names, I, I believe so. So you definitely want to uh, dig through this folder of uh, a wide variety of examples, games, um, here's some animation, uh, all kinds of stuff that you can see how different ways that a canvas can be used. So let's switch over to the web side. Not bat chart, or chart. All right. Let's uh, create our little bar chart example for the web. It's pretty much going to be exactly the same, uh, except you know we're going to use the web components. So. Actually, let me open up my uh, desktop bar chart. So this here is my desktop bar chart that uh, we looked at earlier. So we're just going to essentially move this code over with uh, little to no change over to the website. So we've got our, our web canvas here, and I want to add the paint event handler. And this is the code here from the desktop project, and that can be used uh, as is. Nothing uh, terribly uh, strange going on here. The same fill rect methods available. Uh, the same G parameter is passed in, except it's a web graphics rather than a desktop graphics, but you can still draw to it and do most of the same things. Uh, so you can see that's the same. Uh, and the other things that are on here also be the same, so I'm just going to move those over. And you'll, if you haven't noticed that before, uh, yeah, I did multi-select a bunch of things and just copy and paste them all over at once. Uh, that's something uh, that Zojo can do. Older versions of Real Studio could not do that. It comes in pretty handy at times. And uh, again, we haven't uh, changed anything here. Same properties, same method that does very little. But we can set up our web page, much like we set up the window.
and go back to inspector and give this one a name. And our code for the action event handler is not really going to be any different. Again, we'll just convert what was typed into the field into an array, set up the properties, and then draw the graph. So I'm now in a web browser. And the same exact sort of thing works. And this is great because it's always great when you don't have to significantly change your code, or in this case, really change it at all between desktop and web. And the only thing to keep in mind when you're doing uh, web graphics in your web applications is uh, obviously the latency with your web application and uh, the fact that you know all the graphics commands are going to be uh, done at once. So you may not be able to do the type of animation that you maybe were, uh, were doing on a desktop application. There are some optimizations in the web canvas. Uh, to help it draw a little quicker in web browsers. So if you have a lot of draw commands in your paint event handler, uh, there's some diff code in there because the way this works behind the scenes is all these draw commands are converted to JavaScript and sent off to the browser where it's drawn there using an HTML canvas uh, for maximum efficiency. But all those draw commands are diffed before they're sent to the browser. So only the commands that are actually different and need to run again will get uh, sent to the browser. So that can uh, really help speed up some of the transfer time and some of the latency issues when dealing with uh, web applications. All right, so I have a few other web projects here to take a look at. Let me just check my questions real quick. Uh, so Terry is confirming a container only holds other controls while a canvas is primarily for handling graphics. Uh, yeah, and that's an accurate summary, uh, Terry. Uh, a container is really, I mean, there's not much reason to use it other than to hold controls. And the canvas really is for drawing things. And there's some slight overlap with putting the controls in the canvas, like I mentioned, for scrolling. But other than that, the, the two are pretty distinct. All right, let me switch over to my uh, web folder. Take a look at a couple other uh, little applications that use canvases. And this one doesn't do anything other than draw a bunch of boxes in a web canvas to show that it does support many of the same methods that are available on the uh, the desktop. So again, all, uh, all common stuff that you may have already seen in desktop applications, but much of it works just as is on uh, web applications. And speaking of which, let me open up this project here, which is uh, has some custom controls that are designed using canvases for a web project. And these are designed to simulate iOS controls. And you'll notice the switch control that is here um, is very similar to the one that I did in the desktop uh, demo. And actually, I created this web one first. This project's been around for a little while. And uh, I was able, again, to just move this code over to a desktop project. And I don't think I had to change anything again, uh, because the drawing of the circles and the flipping and everything is all standard code that works in desktop, works in web, no, no differences. So I was able to move this control over to the desktop side and use it as is. And this one shows you how you can implement some other controls using canvases. Actually, I think this is definitely a canvas. Some of these other ones may not be a canvas, but this one here is definitely a canvas. Even the, uh, the clock project that was on the desktop side has a web equivalent doing the same sort of thing. 
uh, you actually probably wouldn't want to put this clock project on an actual server somewhere. It works great locally, but it does have a timer that's firing every second and telling the uh, canvas to redraw itself. That does create a fair amount of traffic if this were sitting out on a public server somewhere. Uh, but the overall technique still works. So if you're creating something that's uh, more local based on an internet or something like that, you can start to do a little bit of simple animation using this. And this here is the uh, a more advanced graph that you can see. This part of the uh, this graph is actually also included in the Eddie's Electronics web example. But you can see the more sophisticated graph here over the simple bar chart that uh, we did earlier. But it actually has a full grid. It's showing uh, months down here at the bottom, some values for scale has a line graph here with each point highlighted with a box. I can actually click on individual points and get an additional information to appear right next to it. So you can really get uh, pretty clever with how some of this stuff works. And looking at that code, Again, you can see it. when you're dealing with a canvas, the first thing you always want to do is go to the paint event handler. Uh, there may be a bunch of code in here, uh, or maybe uh, sending, uh, calling a method, and then the, the method's doing the code. But this essentially is going to be the point of origin for all the drawings. So you, you're going to want to start here. So you can see here this thing is just doing, again, a bunch of the drawings. This, this really is super uh, complicated. Uh, it just is a series of steps to draw whatever it is you want. And sometimes doing some scaling to make sure that things fit the way you want them to fit and whatnot. But, you know, it's just drawing one thing after another. All the axes, the lines, the data points. Checking if things were clicked and those are marked. Uh, again, you, know, you see it's using, again, some of the techniques that I showed in the two uh, projects that let you click on items and move them around by having a class, in this uh, case, data point, that uh, can be used to check uh, what was clicked. And then it's just gen this particular one is generating uh, random uh, data for the graph. The one in Eddie's Electronics, which you can also pull down, actually uses the actual data from the database to populate the graph. So that's a, uh, you know, a better example of how you can see how that might be used in a, uh, you know, more practical way. All right, I'm just looking at my folder again. I've got so many files in here that I'm trying to pick the good ones. Let's look at that one. This is uh, similar to the other grid one that we just looked at for the desktop, where you can click on individual cells and highlight things. Uh, this is showing two different techniques for doing it, one using the web canvas and another using an image view with a picture. Uh, the web canvas was added to the web framework, uh, I believe, in one of the 2012 releases, the later 2012 releases. So it's relatively new when it comes to the web framework. So this project is able to uh, demonstrate the difference or how you might want to do it with a image view or a canvas. In almost all cases at this point, you're going to want to use the web canvas over uh, using an image view and constantly sending a, a picture uh, graphic back to the, down to the browser. But you can see the two examples are on here. And it uh, looks like they both have subclasses. So you can compare and contrast how they're handling uh, the various events and drawing things and whatnot.
Now, one other technique I wanted to mention that you can do, I don't think I have that project anymore, on the desktop side, particularly when you're, um, let me open up one of these here. Going back to this uh, project here, if you look at the properties of the canvas, you can see down here there's some behavior settings. And you want to pay attention to these, again, particularly if you're developing on Windows, uh, to ensure that you can uh, completely eliminate any flicker that you may be dealing with. Uh, particularly this double buffer property, uh, which only does anything on Windows, so it doesn't really need to be on here on an OS X app. You can turn it on to allow Zojo to uh, uh, double buffer the graphics drawing for you. And that can, uh, like I mentioned earlier, help reduce flicker. Uh, and again, the double buffering, rather than uh, having, which, which is what Windows does, which it draws each thing to the screen one after another. And if those don't happen fast enough, you see each individual drawing, and that gives the uh, an odd flickery effect. A double buffer allows all these drawings to happen essentially off screen. And then once all the drawing is done off screen where, you know, they're off screen so no one sees them and it's all completed, it's brought to the visible screen in one step. So there's no flicker. It's a common technique. It's used in games. Uh, OS X uses it throughout the operating system as do most versions of Linux. Uh, and some uh, frameworks on Windows actually use it. I believe .NET does take advantage of double buffer for its UIs, but the Win32 elements that are on Windows do not. But you can take advantage of that by doing the double buffering yourself. And the easiest first thing to do is to flip on the double buffering switch if you're doing uh, something on Windows. If that proves to be a problem, you can always double buffer yourself by instead of drawing to the, uh, let's see if I can open up the paint event here. Instead of drawing directly to the G object one thing at a time, you can draw to a graphic that you store in your project, much like this. And you just draw the picture. So instead of doing multiple steps of drawing, you essentially have done all your drawing in a picture that's just a property on your canvas somewhere. And you just draw to that. And, and then when it comes time in your paint event, you just draw the picture in one single step. So that is how you would implement your own uh, double buffering, so to speak. And it can be very handy uh, for certain types of applications. And it can be handy just in general, depending on how you want to design your application so that you can uh, draw to it any time you want because you'll have a picture object uh, and you can then just paint it whenever it needs to be drawn to the screen. All right, I'm checking my folder, but I think that covered all the web ones that I wanted to touch on today. Yeah, I think so. Let me check the time here. Oh, good. That's about where I wanted to finish up. I uh, don't see any outstanding questions at the moment. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that uh, this was asked before, I will have this uh, webinar up and available uh, probably today, if all goes well, uh, in addition to the downloads. So uh, certainly pay attention to the video page or head on over to our YouTube site, youtube.com slash gozojo. You can just subscribe here and then get notifications moments after a video gets uploaded so you don't have to wait. They're just instantly available to you. And I'll, of course, make the example projects available here on uh, this page as well. And if you do head on over to the webinar page, you'll notice the list is getting a little short. There's only uh, one more on the schedule, but the uh, schedule for the next three months should be appearing up here before the end of April. And we'll have some exciting new topics, including a couple guest speakers that will be uh, be talking in the next few months. So you don't always have to listen to me droning on in my webinars.
So that looks like we've covered everything we need to for today. I want to thank everyone for attending. Certainly, if you have questions after the webinar that you uh, forgot to ask during or that maybe I didn't get to for some reason or other, you're always welcome to email me, paul at zojo.com. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your day.